Welcome back, everybody. And today we're going to be looking at the Congress of Vienna. Our lecture is entitled Vienna's Aftermath. We're covering the years 1815 to 1847. And the question we'll be taking up is, how did the Congress of Vienna's effort to restore and maintain a balance of power both reflect and challenge the emerging ideological and national movements in Europe. So grab a pen and paper, a tablet or keyboard, and we'll begin our lecture. Okay, so first of all, what is the Congress of Vienna? The Congress of Vienna is going to be an international meeting. It's going to be held from 1814 to 1815 just as the Napoleonic Wars are coming to an end. It's going to be held in the capital of Austria, which is the capital of the, um, the, the capital of Vienna, the, the city of Vienna, which is the capital of the Austrian Empire. Um, and this is kind of like a comeback tour for the uh, crowned heads of Europe, for the old monarchies. They had been really sidelined, marginalized, uh, deposed oftentimes, sometimes executed during the time of the Napoleonic Wars and the French Revolution. And now that Napoleon was defeated, these crowned monarchs were coming back to not only restore Europe into a, um, you know, what, what they would like, but also to try to prevent something like uh, the French Revolution or Napoleon uh, from ever happening again. We have to remember this was very traumatic for people, especially if you were um, of a conservative bent, especially if um, you believed in traditional systems like the vast, vast majority of the delegates uh, did, then uh, the last 26 years or so of the Napoleonic Wars was, um, and the French Revolution was terrible. Okay. And so what were they, uh, what were their main goals? Well, the main goals of the delegates were to restore the old families as much as they could. Now, as I said, some people had been executed, so obviously they're not coming back. But for the most part, what they tried to do was to try to put the old families back. They saw their old dynastic rights, these ancient families, as giving them legitimacy. Um, new upstarts like the Bonapartes are swept away. Um, any democratic governments uh, don't have any legitimacy in their minds. And so to the degree that they can, they want to restore the old order. So that's their first goal. Their second goal is to prevent any sort of liberal revolution from happening again. Okay. And so they saw their failure to act back in 1789 as a mistake. All right, they had let the French Revolution get out of hand, and then um, it had uh, burnt Europe down in, in their minds. And so part of their goal was to stop these revolutions from happening, uh, no matter what country they happened in. Okay? And then finally, their third goal is, was to maintain a balance of power. And what that means is they didn't want one power getting too much larger than the rest. So for the great powers, and the great powers are at this time are going to be France, Britain, Prussia, Austria, and Russia. All right, so these are the, the major powers. And what they don't want is they don't want one of these powers to become a superpower. Because the fear is, is that if one power gets too powerful, then they'll become a problem and a threat. Whereas if you can keep them all about the same size, then they'll be less of a, a threat. Now, through much of the 16th, 17th, 18th century, even early 19th century, France had been that superpower. 
and they wanted to ensure that the French wouldn't be able to rise up and conquer Europe again. There was also fear that Russia, which had just defeated France, might become the next superpower. And so they were going to work really hard to make sure that um, something like this wouldn't happen again. Okay. So what did they come up with? Well, one of the major things that they did was they redrew the map in order to create a balance of power. All right. So it was recognized that of the major powers, Prussia was the smallest. And so one of the things that they did was they gave Prussia a lot of territory on the French border. All right. And so if you look at this map here, you can see that um, in the east where it says Prussia, that's the traditional Prussian homeland. But they also gave Prussia a bunch of territories right on the French border. And the belief was if they could bolster the size of Prussia, then it could act as a counterweight against France, especially if it was on the border. Um, another thing that they did was they created a enlarged Italian state on the southeastern border. Um, and this was called uh, Piedmont and Sardinia. All right. So, of course, Italy is there isn't an Italian country yet, but they decide that they're going to create this enlarged like um, Italian principality on France's border. And this, they hope, will act as another buffer against the um, French. Um, now, in addition to that, there was a feeling among the countries that had fought Napoleon that they should be rewarded. All right. And so, for instance, Russia was um, obviously a big player. And so they wanted, you know, they'd spent a lot of lives and a lot of treasure defeating Napoleon. And so they wanted to get something out of the wars. This is common. And so one of the things that was given to them was Poland, more of Poland. Briefly, Poland was independent during the Napoleonic Wars. And so you can see Russia gets where Warsaw is and a big part of Poland. They also, Finland gets ceded to them. So they, the Russians get to um, take over Finland as a result of this. England gets a bunch of colonies. So um, South Africa becomes um, uh, Britain and Britain gets various trade um, considerations in the New World. As I already said, Prussia gets some land out of it. And Austria, so the area where the Netherlands are, part of that was part of Austria. And it was recognized that this was very impractical to have Austria in two pieces. And so this new enlarged Netherlands was created um, with pieces what, of what had been the Austrian Netherlands. And to make it up to them, a big piece of northern Italy was given to Austria as compensation. All right. And so... Um, you know, these uh, diplomats felt pretty comfortable swapping around borders and, you know, adjusting things, uh, you know, often at the expense of smaller and weaker states like Finland or Poland or places like that. Um, and so oftentimes what definitely was not considered, and this is going to be a factor, was what the people who actually lived there wanted. In other words, nobody bothered to ask the Northern Italians whether they wanted to be part of the Austrian Empire. Um, the major powers just swapped around these territories because it made sense to them. You know, either one country had to be uh, compensated or uh, we need to... Uh, make another country uh, more powerful so that they can uh, prevent the French from uh, causing problems. All right. 
And so these were some of the major things that were going on. Get the old get the old monarchs back, swap around the territories, uh, make sure there's a balance of power. And the delegates liked this so much. They said, well, this is great. You know, here we are where we're solving problems. We're not doing it through war. We're doing it through diplomacy. Uh, you know, by all accounts, the, the Congress of Vienna was a very charming environment. And what they decided to do is they said, well, why don't we do this more often? And so they created this um, mechanism called the concert system. All right. And the concert system was going to be periodic diplomatic meetings like this. And the goal was to prevent future escalations of war. Um, to try to promote international cooperation and to make adjustments to the balance of power, all right? Uh, occasionally, uh, you know, if one country maybe was getting too powerful, maybe, you know, some sorts of adjustments could be made diplomatically. And so you could think of this as an early model of the UN, all right, in the same way that the UN is supposed to um, be a diplomatic forum where countries can work out their difference, um, this is you know, a very early model of that. Now, obviously, it doesn't include the world or anything. It's just the major European powers. All right. And it kind of works, uh, you know, is for, for all the faults. And we're going to see there's a lot of faults in the Congress of Vienna. For all its faults, it does give Europe like 99 years of peace, which is impressive for Europe. Not that there's no wars during this time, but there's no major wars. And in the period before this, and of course in the 20th century, um, there were quite a few of these. So it was a pretty um, successful in that regard. Okay, and so, you know, we leave the Congress of Vienna and there's this spirit of cooperation and um, you know, peace, I guess you could say, among these conservative leaders who recognize that revolution is going to be really dangerous to them. Um, and so they're going to try to avoid war at all costs because wars lead to chaotic revolutionary circumstances. Okay. Well, there are a lot of tensions, however. And a lot of these are not addressed by the Congress of Vienna. And one of the most contentious is the issue of national self-determination. You'll remember when we talked about Napoleon that Napoleon's laws had spurred nationalism by removing these kings and these uh, priests and the church and telling people that, you know, they were a nation and that they had rights and the will of the people and all of that stuff that came out of the French Revolution, they had, Napoleon had inadvertently spurred nationalist movements. We saw it in France and in, uh, excuse me, we saw it, well, yes, in France, but we saw it in Spain and in Germany also. And... In the post-Vienna world, even though the major powers aren't going to attack each other, many of the people living within these empires, like Austria or Russia, are going to uh, be very agitated by this. All right. Many of these people feel that they have a common language, a common culture, and these feelings of nationalism really start to take root among the populace. And some of the nations that feel particularly aggrieved are Poland. And we can see why Poland, if we look at this map, why Poland would be aggrieved, right? They don't, there is no Poland. It's divided among the three, it's three uh, neighbors, Prussia, Russia, and Austria, with Russia having the largest share. So Poland is, the Poles want their homeland. They don't identify with any of these neighbors. Italy. If we look at Italy, Italy is divided among different powers and 
there's different small little Italian states or there's um, foreign powers like Austria that is that are dominating it. And so the Italians also start to feel this nationalist urge. The only major Italian kingdom is that kingdom of Piedmont and Sardinia that I mentioned. And they're going to be important. We'll have to keep our eye on them. Now, in the case of Poland and Italy, we can maybe see why they would feel this way because, well, they've got foreigners in their country or what they think is their country. Germany also feels this way, but it's not so much that they're being dominated by non-Germans because they're not. The issue for them is that there is no Germany. So, yes, there's a bunch of competing small uh, German kingdoms plus Prussia and Austrian. They're all German speakers, but they want this united Germany. And so there is something cr created called the Germanic Confederation. And this is designed once again to thwart France. But this is a confederation. It falls far short of a state. It's just there like as an agreement that they will come to each other's defense. But there is, you know, there's not going to be a parliament or anything um, to this. And another place that we should look out for is the area called the Balkans. And this is that place in the bottom right hand corner of the map you're looking at where the Ottoman Empire and the Austrian Empire meet. This is another place where nationalist uh, uprisings are going to start to occur. Okay. And if we, this is a picture of uh, this area and we can see that it's just a gigantic mess of different peoples. There's dozens of languages. There's quite a few different religions, uh, different cultures. Uh, it's uh, a gigantic checkerboard of different peoples and as they each start to get their own sense of national uh, uh, nationality nationhood this is going to become uh, a very troubled spot we'll say okay so despite the fact that the congress of vienna had tried to uh, nail the coffin shut on liberalism. Um, liberalism does not go away with the French Revolution. If anything, you could argue that um, it becomes more comp complicated. So, you know, um, in the post-Vienna world, we get even more radical movements we get, you know, the liberalism of, um, of France during the French Revolution, but we get movements that are even further to the left, like socialism starting to emerge. And these weren't even really imagined when the, um, when the Congress of Vienna met. And there's a whole bunch of different shades of liberalism, I guess we could call it. Um, and you know, there are going to be some liberals who just feel like upper class males should vote. And some are going to think that uh, the working people, uh, every male should vote. Um, others are just going to be socialist or, or whatever. But whatever flavor they come in, despite the fact that conservatives are doing their best to tamp down on these, many liberal movements are going to spread and they're going to challenge the conservative order all right and this is going to be a big issue in the upcoming uh, lectures that we're going to see is this movement toward uh, constitutions or civil liberties or um, you know sometimes these will merge with nationalist movements so um, it's going to be uh, something to look out for. All right. Well, we should talk a little bit about the East-West divide. All right. 
because the reaction among the ruling powers is going to be quite different whether we're in the east or we're in the west. Now, among the Eastern great powers, and these are going to be Prussia, Austria, and Russia, these tend to be quite a bit more conservative. All right. So they are going to be particularly vigilant against any sort of democratic movements, any sort of liberal ideology. Um, they're going to especially emphasize traditional Christianity as a counterweight to um, uh, you, you know, what they see as godless, soulless liberalism. All right. And so one of the main delegates at the Congress of Vienna is a guy by the name of Clemens von Metternich. And in many ways, he's the leader of the, the whole Congress. And he really takes the lead in creating something called the Holy Alliance. This holy alliance is going to be uh, made up of the three emperors of these three eastern powers. And they're going to engage in very strict censorship. They recognize the dangers that uh, papers play, newspapers, or college campuses oftentimes. And so they're going to uh, do a lot of surveillance and a lot of censorship. And they're going to be vigilant not only for liberalism, but especially in Austria's case, also nationalist movements, because I've, I just showed you that map of Austria. Austria is really just the mishmash of different nationalities. And the fear is, is that if any of these ever, you know, if these movements ever uh, take off, then it'll mean the disintegration of the Austrian Empire, something Metternich doesn't want. And so uh, some of the more famous things to come out of uh, the Holy Alliance is uh, the, the Carlsbad Decrees. And these are really designed to limit academic freedom. Um, it's recognized early on that uh, universities are a hotbed of radical ideas. And, um, you know, also, you know, the press, like I said. Now, in comparison to the east, although we wouldn't really consider it particularly um, liberal or progressive by today's ideas, was um, France and especially Britain. Many of the things that liberals in other countries wanted, like a free press or um, some sort of represent, representative body or a constitutional monarchy, well, those had been in, you know, in existence in Britain for like over 100 years at this point. And so in Britain, even though conservatives, you know, are, you know, I'm doing air quotes, are, are the, uh, in the ascendancy for the most part in this period, you know, these conservatives would be considered liberals in other countries. Um, conservatism in Britain embraces a gradual reform and gradual change. Um, they're less uh, enamored by ideas like aristocracy or um, even monarchy. You know, the monarch in England isn't particularly powerful even uh, by this stage. Press freedoms are quite a bit better in Britain. And they're also really in the lead of economic reforms. Remember, this is the early years of the Industrial Revolution. Um, there's uh, uh, broadening political participation and France to a lesser degree uh, this is going to be true as well even as the old monarchy is put back in power the old Bourbon family um, even they have to make some concessions uh, to liberalism okay so last thing I want to talk about is some of these lingering issues and unresolved tensions that are going to really take us into the mid-century. Um, so national unrest, we want to highlight again the Germanic Confederation. It's not a country. It's a, it's a weak government. Germany is still going to be divided. Uh, Italians in Poles are particularly dissatisfied. Uh, 
uh, with what they well, which with what are foreigners uh, either partially or totally dominating their countries. And uh, we, uh, you know, this whole issue of people who consider themselves to be a nation versus the state apparatus that they happen to live under, oftentimes an empire that they happen to live under, is going to lead to a lot of dissatisfaction and lead to tension and re result, uh, revolts. Um, liberal ideas are going to persist even in Eastern Europe, even though they're repressed. They're just going to go underground. Um, there's going to be widespread dissatisfaction among people who are disempowered. They don't have a political uh, voice uh, against absolutist policies. These become increasingly unpopular. And there's a desire for greater inclusivity of politics, whatever that's going to look like, more to give the vote to more people, to have greater amounts of civil liberties, um, the call for restrictions on the power of the monarchy, uh, you know, an end to absolute monarchy, uh, constitutions, these are all going to become the rallying cry. And, you know, as the delegates are going home in 1815, the Industrial Revolution is really, really just starting, and that's going to begin to make all kinds of inroads over the next decades, even, even outside of Britain increasingly. And this is going to bring a bunch of social change that's going to make um, the settlements that conservatives uh, crafted at the Congress of Vienna increasingly untenable. Okay, so... What I would like you to do is I would like you to think about this question. How did the Congress of Vienna's effort to restore and maintain a balance of power both reflect and challenge the emerging ideological and national movements across Europe? <laughs>